I grew up with an understanding that healthcare was a universal human right. I've lived my last 28 years of my career seeing that it is. But the challenge is that I sleep at night every day and I question, is it really? Do governments really care about people? Do we all have access to quality health care? Are we happy with the state of health care in Africa? The truth is, the answer is no. There is a big challenge in the world. And to be able to buttress this, why is it that when we talk about maps of the world and we put Africa on it, that we either painted black or in this case painted red for the wrong reasons? If you look at this chart here, what do you see? The life expectancy in Africa is 20 years less than that of Europe. 20 years. In some parts of Europe, even up to 40 years. We bring it back to West Africa. The life expectancy in Ghana is 64 years. The life expectancy in our country, Nigeria, is 54 years, 10 years less. This is a complete failure of our healthcare systems. We have some of the poorest statistics and indices in Africa. We represent one quarter of the global disease burden in the world. In Nigeria, 10% of maternal deaths and under five mortality is in Nigeria. To bring this home, we are the second contributor to under five mortality and maternal death, mothers dying. Every day in our country, 145 children, mothers die. 2,300 children. Now, this may not sound so easy to understand, but look at that plane crash. That is equivalent of having one plane crash of women every single day. And 16 of children every single day. Is that a country any of us want to live in? But we are living it right now. The reality is that this cannot continue. And it's majorly because of a plethora of challenges that pervade the healthcare industry. First, starting with low public expenditure. Several years ago, exactly 17 years ago, the African Union came together in a city in Nigeria, Abuja, and declared the Abuja Declaration that we will put together a fund and make sure that all of us spend 15% of our national budgets on healthcare. 17 years later, only four countries in Africa have been able to achieve that. Nigeria, unfortunately, is not one. Ours is 3.8% of our total budget is spent on healthcare. And unfortunately, 80% of that is on salaries, recurrent expenditure, with only 20% on infrastructure. To change what we need to do, to reverse some of the terrible challenges, we need to have world-class infrastructure, backed by world-class equipment, run by people who care and who have empathy and who have skill sets. The way this can be done cannot be the way it is being done right now. We need better types of regulation. We need self-accreditation. We need people staying in country. I'm sure many of you know friends who in the last 10 years have left Nigeria. We've had three decades of brain drain. We've lost some of our biggest, brightest physicians, pharmacists, nurses to other countries. As we speak today, we lose 12 doctors a week in Nigeria in the last six months to the UK. Our do doctors are going to Canada, US, South Africa. We only have 37,000 doctors in Nigeria, but we have 30,000 Nigerian doctors in the US and 5,000 in the UK. How are we going to change the name of the game if we don't have people? This deplorable infrastructure that exists again is another big challenge. It is important that we understand that the future is in our hands and that we can't continue to allow this to happen. On the screen should be a picture of a family, a lady with her five children. We in Africa know that children are very important to us. But every day, women have to make certain choices for themselves that are things that we in this room don't want to be able to do. 
So this particular lady has five kids. And unfortunately, she happens to be poor. And she has only one bottle of medicine. Tell me, which of those five children should she give? Should she give the youngest? Or should she give the oldest? Should she give the only boy? Because boys are sometimes more important than girls in Africa. This is a choice that nobody should make, but unfortunately they have to. Why? Because every time you get sick in any country in Africa, you become more impoverished by the day, and this vicious cycle of poverty continues because we have to pay out of pocket for healthcare. Our insurance in our country, Nigeria, is only 5%. So this is not sustainable. So being poor is a death sentence when it comes to healthcare. So do we want this mumbo-jumbo system of healthcare we have right now, with no systems and processes, or do we want to see things work like they should be? The only way to be able to do this is to start to think out of the box, to understand that each and every one of us has a collective responsibility as stakeholders in healthcare to make a difference. Are you ready to make a difference? Can we continue to leave healthcare where it is? What can we do to leapfrog healthcare from where it is to where it should be? What can we do to reverse this negative brain drain and now patient drain? We have to be able to change the name of the game. And to be able to do that, we want to be able to, whatever solution, whatever innovation we do must look after three basic features. It must change quality. We must have an emphasis on results, on outcomes. We must bring down the cost to make it more affordable for every patient. And finally, it must be sustainable in nature. We don't want quick fix solutions. We want long-term solutions that we're able to make a difference. Disease patterns are changing in Africa. We have non-communicable diseases now. HIV, AIDS, and malaria kill a lot of people. But the truth is, WHO has said that cancer today kills more people than those three diseases combined. So if we don't take a concerted effort to look at the future of healthcare, we will not be where we need to be. It is important that you understand that healthcare is wealth. But it's only wealth if we create it collectively and that we take a stakeholder's engagement that I, in this room, I, anywhere in the world, can make a difference. You see, there are three things, to my mind, that can help us to build a quality healthcare system. And it starts at the fulcrum of having access to affordable finance, both for the patient who needs to be able to get service and for those that need to provide it. And we also need to talk and fix the issues to do with human resources for healthcare. And what I want to introduce to you today is this issue of innovative financing and incentives. How can we create a pool of funds that will help to pay for people to get a mobile phone, to be able to have access to information, to know when their antiretroviral drugs are due, to know when their next antenatal appointment is due, so that the babies right now who are born by unskilled laborers is it will go. 70% of babies in Nigeria are born by people, by, by people who unfortunately have no skills in giving birth to, to, to healthy babies. And this is why we have the kind of terrible maternal mortality that we have. So I would like to introduce you to domestic resource mobilization. But it starts with your engagement in this room. That you decide on your own that you want to put an opt-in in your life. And that we all together advocate to government to create that enabling environment and pass this policy. What do I mean by opt-in? I would like to opt-in to say that every phone call I make, 1% of that phone call goes into a healthcare fund. It won't touch me. 20 kobo for one minute. How do you compute 1% of 20 kobo? But it's not about how much it is for one person. It is how much the pool of fund will be able to have an impact on us. Can we create incentives such that all the corporate citizens that are paying corporate income tax can get a tax break if 1% of the existing tax that they pay, not anymore, can go into this healthcare fund? If our taxes that we pay on a personal income basis, that we can take 1% of that, so it's the 1% opt-in policy, something that all of us can advocate to government to make sure happens. With this pool of fund, the next thing many of you will tell me 
is that if we provide this pool of fund, how do we know our money will be used properly? It can only be done by a strategic partnership with the private sector. The private sector has a major role to play. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We've seen it happen already in pensions, where you know every month an amount of your salary is put aside towards pensions. That one day you have this rainy day fund so that you can live a good life in your retirement. But it's a private sector manager that is managing that fund. So we're going to make it a public-private partnership where government can put money into this fund, but private sector, all of us can put money into this fund ourselves and create this wealth. But to be able to be sure, what do we want to do with this money? We want to be able to make sure that that money is used wisely. Now, how many of you here don't have a mobile phone? I don't need to do a statistic because I know you all do. But how many of us are making that mobile phone work for us to make a difference? The average person in Nigeria is not you and I. They don't have a phone, but 89 million of us do. If we can provide the rest of the 100 million with a basic phone, we can use innovation to close the divide. We can provide them with access to insurance so they don't have to pay out of pocket. We can make sure that at the end of the day, that money is used to build skill centers, to build new medical schools, that the private sector, instead of paying 26% interest rates for two or three years, can now build the mega hospitals that people that leave our shores go to. Because they can get interest at say seven, eight, nine percent long term in nature. We here can create the future, but it cannot be business as usual. We need to think out of the box. And these are a few ideas. Now, if we create this infrastructure, we have the great equipment, we have the technology, and we don't have people, how are we going to make a difference? I've already told you how many doctors there are in Nigeria, but the gap is that we need about 303,000 doctors right now to close the gap. It means that if we go to every medical school today and graduate everybody early, 10 years in advance, we still cannot close the gap. So the existence of opening new medical schools may be one way, but the new way will be how do we leverage on technology to be able to make a difference? How can we make sure that it is not about the number of doctors, but it's about the outcomes? This can be done by us making sure that all, or what we would call task shifting in the, in the industry, that some people do some delegation that a part of the doctor's job will be given to the nurse, a part of the nurse's job will be given to the midwife, a part of the midwife's job will be given to the traditional birth attendant, and we can now create a pool of other people that can help close this divide. We can use mobile technology, what we call M-Health, to close the gap, to inform patients much better, to keep them where they should be. We can have new computers with artificial intelligence, with blockchain technology, that can have algorithms that help people who are not so learned, that are not trained doctors and pharmacists and nurses, to do some basic care, especially in the primary health care area. These are some of the things that we could do by leveraging technology to close that divide. The issue really is that business as usual cannot change the name of the game. We are all stakeholders in health care. For every time somebody dies, we are all responsible. It is time that collectively we advocate for policies that will enable the private sector to be opened up, to unleash the potentials. It's time for convergence of industries, banking, fast mover consumer items, healthcare to come together to concertively change the issues at hand. We cannot do this alone, but collectively we are great. There is power in numbers. You and I can make the difference. Are you ready to do that? If you are, make it your vocation. Make it your pastime. Let us be able to make sure that everybody has access to quality universal health coverage. Thank you.